So we're actually starting now, okay. Usually I like to, to begin by asking if there's anyone who, who speaks Polish in the audience. I guess not, okay. Well, it might come up later, but we'll just power on through. Uh, so this talk's entitled Rethinking Font Packages. Um, and it's, it's rethinking only if you've thought about font packages in the past. Um, in particular, uh, the subtitle here is from the document down, and the document part is the thing that I actually wanted to talk about. This is actually my second DebConf, but it's the first one where I've said anything, and it's because I have been thinking about this font packaging issue for a while. Uh, but first, before we get into that, a little initial tangent, just to set some context. If I look familiar to you, it, it's because I spent about 15 years being a, a FOSS journalist, most recently with LWN, which is still where you should get your news about uh, free software and open source. Uh, I still sort of think of myself as, as being a part-time contributor there, even though it's been ages since I've actually contributed something. Uh, but about two years ago, I, I left to go study typeface design in England at the University of Reading, which is one of the few places where they, they teach that. That course lasted through September of 2017. Um, after that, I started consulting, at least in theory, on, on typographic related things. So, you know, if you, if you need help with open type or Unicode or one of those things, come see me, I suppose. Uh, but I, I got some contracts, but decided I didn't want to try and fill every waking hour with that sort of work. And instead, I made a list of other things I could do with my free time that, that dealt with uh, fonts and type in the free software world. And there was a lot of those, everything from, from actual design work to the document templates and what we ship with our fonts and that sort of thing. But the one I kept coming back to was this big disconnect between how people in the design field work with their font collection and the way we work with our font collection on Linux. Uh, that's because for that year that I was in Reading, I spent a lot of time around graphic designers and book designers and information designers, and I got to see how they work firsthand, uh, and how they select fonts in particular. And I think that as far as the, the font plumbing goes, if we were to examine how things are set up from the workflow or through the lens of the workflow that people in this profession use, we'd end up with something really different than the way it is currently configured. Um, and if you want proof of that, just Consider the fact that free software fonts on services like Google Fonts just dominate the web. It's trillions and trillions of hits, but they don't really make a big dent anywhere else. And not a lot of people are using desktop Linux distributions to do typographic work. So uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to sort of walk through that workflow that I, that I got to see firsthand from people. And then we'll talk about where it doesn't match what desktop systems do today. And then finally, we'll get into uh, how that affects font packaging, because that's one of the big contributions that the Debian project has on desktop font architecture is Debian and Debian derivatives provide the vast majority of the packaged fonts to desktop Linux users. So right into fantasy land. It starts here. The user is working on a document, OK? And in fact, it's a particular document, which is an important specific point to note because each specific project alters something. And whatever that particular document is, it's, uh, it's going to set the constraints that follow. Um, in this case, let's pretend that it's the annual report for your project. And it's a large project, so you care about the annual report. I think the GNOME Foundation or, I don't know, OpenStack or some enormous project like that. You might show this document to people that you hope to get resources from. So you're going to do it right. Um, and I think the thing to keep in mind is that the context, the document is the context in which all further decisions are made. And a lot of the workflow descriptions I've seen about selecting fonts sort of leave that out. They just say, the user is selecting a font. And I think that puts you in a blind alley. And these constraints that are requirements and restrictions on what you can and can't do and conditions you need to meet, some of which are aesthetic, some of which are technical, that really determines everything that follows. So in this case, our annual report, we're going to say, we're going to typeset it this year in English and Persian. We also need to have a few words in Spanish and German, like let's say there's some names that we need to do. So it won't be long stretches, but we need to make sure the right accent marks and special characters are there. And remember, it's going to look good to people who read a lot and who will 
toss it aside if it looks unprofessional. So when we say it's going to set English and Persian, it needs to look balanced. And it has section titles, and it has images with captions, and it has tables of things. And all those pieces need to look like they were done correctly. OK, so what is the workflow we use? Well, we open the font manager. And if you do a lot of document creation, you probably have a lot of fonts installed, a couple hundred, maybe. Hopefully, they're good ones. Um, and the first thing we want to do is search for fonts that support those design languages, mainly Arabic and English. And when we say that we search for these things to be designed together, that's because they need to look right together on the page. You can't have one of them look a lot darker than the other. You can't have the lines be off. And if you pick a font where the Latin and the Arabic were designed together, you don't have to spend every waking hour making minute adjustments to the line spacing. Uh, you can't have things be different optical sizes so that one paragraph takes up much larger vertical space than the other, that sort of thing. What happens, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a billion choices when we set those constraints. We might find several, let's say several dozen fonts that have English and Arabic together, but all of them, or most of them, are going to be missing something. Like they don't have the asset or they don't have the tilde over the N. Uh, or they are Arabic, but they're designed to support the Arabic language, not Persian, which is a different style. Uh, yeah, and by the way, half of them are really funky display types. They're not for setting text, so they look like graffiti or a bunch of balloons or a retro video game or something like that. But this is just the start of the process. It's not a problem yet. The next thing we do is filter those fonts that we have left for things that have the variations that we need. So we need some italics, we need some weight, maybe just a bold, maybe more than one. And we want those optical sizes because we need to have image captions, which are really, really small. And we need to have titles, which are really, really big. Uh, back to reality, the number of alternative drops, obviously, when we do this. Now, we think to ourselves, at this point, we could start giving things up. right? We could say, we'll just use a different font for the section titles and things. That's a possibility. It's not the normal workflow. And it also just changes the discussion too much. So we'll, we'll keep searching for the perfect font. Next thing we do, maybe look at some samples. I mean, we have a few options left, but we need to see that they actually work together in a document, that there's nothing unusual about them when you look at a whole page or a whole paragraph. Uh, so we open the specimens that came with these fonts. See them in use. And let's say that that causes us to toss something out because a couple of them are really too ornate and they look like calligraphy, they look like a wedding invitation, not really a, a document that we would use for business purposes. Fine. We have some potential choices left. OK? So things are not impossible yet. We do still need to make sure we have our technical features. And in this case, because we're doing tables of numbers, we need to make sure that we have tabular numbers in the font. And we probably also want to make sure that we have lining and non-lining numbers so that when we have years and things in the running text, those look OK, too. Uh, so what we do is we just keep searching in the font manager for those features. And then we hit a dead end. This is pretty deep into the process. So maybe we just have only one font left that meets every other requirement, but it doesn't have one thing. Like it doesn't have tabular numerals. Um, that's not an impossible situation to find yourself in. So what do you do at that point? You can pivot. You can look for something else. You can say, well, this is just one font. Maybe we can find a font with compatible numbers and set the table in that instead. So. We would look for maybe a font by the same designer, like if the Latin is listed as being a, a Caslon design or a Jensen or something. We've probably got another Jensen somewhere in those hundreds of fonts. Uh, or maybe we just know that this is from a particular foundry. People don't do crazy things with numbers, so we'll look and see if the foundry has another font we can use that will hopefully match and not st stand out too much. Uh, no dice, though. Uh, maybe we find one other font release, but it's another one of those crazy fonts that we can't use. So what do we do then? Well, so far, we've just been looking at the fonts already installed. So we need to see what else is available that maybe we just haven't downloaded onto our machine yet. So we use the package manager. For the sake of time, I'm not going to repeat all those same searches, but it would be basically the same process. You, you look for the, the, the facets of the font family that you need in terms of the language and the features that it supports and the range of uh, variations that it supports. And uh, we're just going to say, because it takes us all the way down the path here, we don't get any better luck at this point. And maybe we don't actually have anything available to us through the distribution that will do what we want. Perhaps with a, a last bit of desperation, if we pop open a terminal and we, we search around with apt cache and 
and find and s locate and whatever else you want. Um, but that's not going to find anything for us. Um, in fact, we're, we're dead on this machine. We're going to have to go somewhere else. But that's life. So we start just searching on the web. Maybe we go to Google Fonts. Maybe we just look at other sites that deal with fonts and look at the little sites that the designers have put up describing what their font does. Maybe there's more specimens to look at. And this time we succeed. What happens next is we get a zip file downloaded from this website that has the font. We open it up, and then there's a download helper that's associated with our web browser that installs the font locally to the machine. And it finds that documentation and other stuff in the zip file and puts it in the right places. And then we, being smart, tag this in our font manager so that we know this is what we're using for this particular project. And next year, when we're doing the report, we know we've got at least one font that we can use. OK, so we're done. We found the perfect font. How possible is this presently? Not at all. Uh, or maybe barely. Why is that? Well, I would say there's a handful of factors, starting with the fact that that font manager we used in the first stage doesn't really exist. You might remember a program called Font Matrix a few years ago, which did exist. It's no longer being developed. Um, in fact, I think there are people who make sure it still compiles, but it's, it's got limited time left. It's on an old version of Qt, so it's not going to last forever. There is also something called a GTK Font Manager, which is a little bit less full featured. And I'll get more in depth into that in a little bit, but it's also not exactly what we want in this situation. Um, in addition to that, it's not, it's a personal project by one developer, so it doesn't come by default in a GNOME installation, even though it's a GTK related app. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that. The second factor, which is the software center, is much the same. The software center doesn't have all that information that we were searching on that the font manager did. Uh, fortunately, it, it does have some information. Um, it has the names of the fonts, so you can tell sort of accidentally if it's a big family with multiple styles. There's usually a human written description, which gives you information. There's a screenshot, but that might be automatically generated. And there's some kind of sample, which is a quick brown fox kind of pangram. The third factor is the web installation, which is uniformly terrible on Linux today in the sense that nothing happens. You get that zip file. It looks like this. You can open it with the archive manager. This is an actual, actual font. There's a ton of stuff there. There's a lot of files. There's a documentation folder. There's a web folder. Uh, as you can see, there's actually sources and PDFs of some of that documentation. But nothing happens when you quote unquote install it, except that it gets put into, or the font files, the binaries get put into a particular folder in your home directory. Uh, another tangent here, the reason this is something I'm harping on is that there are only two ways that you get fonts onto a system these days with a little bit of an asterisk. You either, it either comes through the package manager or it comes off the web. Now the, the third option is that you build the font locally and install it, but that's sort of a different beast entirely. And hypothetically, there would be a fourth one, which is a synchronization service, but no one currently offers that. It might come in the future. We'll see. But that's why that matters, because if it doesn't come through the distribution, it comes from the web. Uh, the fourth factor, distribution packaging infrastructure doesn't really support the user's needs. It supports OS integration. Uh, in other words, when you copy that font from the zip folder or wherever else into your .fonts directory, that makes it available to the operating system. It doesn't make it available to the user um, in the meaningful sense that we were looking at in that workflow example, um, which is kind of the big dichotomy of fonts because they are software and content at the same time. Right? They contain executable instructions that get run by an interpreter, but they are also a page element that the user is actively interacting with and manipulating as part of the design process. And the software stack basically just supports the OS part of that, the software part. Uh, the fifth and final factor is that font packages themselves tend not to be very rich items. This varies a lot, to be sure, but on the whole, they're minimal. They contain the binary and, and not a whole lot else. Um, or as unnamed source Richard Hughes put it, we package them like they're CLI apps, even though that's not what they are. So um, I guess the thesis of, of looking at this example is that 
when we don't address that content dimension with the software stack, then we give users no choice but to go elsewhere for their information about what's in the font and what it can do, what those features are. There's a lot of websites where you drag and drop a font and it shows you what the features are and things like that. Fortunately, I think all of those factors are addressable. Some of them are already in the process of being addressed because people do care about this stuff. And I would break it down into sort of three dimensions, although I should point out that the dimensions are not Euclidean and separate from each other, but you know, we'll see. The first one is, is metadata, which is what we talked about in all those searching and filtering examples. The second one is those resources that come in the font download package that we don't know what to do with. And the third one is package behavior. And although I'm kind of targeting this talk at people who maintain font packages, the other things are important too because I think if you're a font package maintainer, you ought to know what is happening elsewhere in the stack. So let's look at the metadata example first. Uh, as, is, as we noticed, most of the searching and the sorting in that workflow example was done on metadata, not on the actual glyphs in the font. Um, this is a screenshot of GTK Font Manager. Uh, it has a little bit of metadata there. It has weight, width, and style, which are directly read from the font binary tables, and those are actually pretty old. That's sort of the Microsoft way of dividing up fonts. It's not necessarily helpful to you. What does medium mean exactly in this case? What's normal? It also shows you that it's proportional. The spacing thing is just, whether it's monospace or not, that very rarely comes up in making documents. You can also see sort of a waterfall example, a little bit of context there. Uh, it's automatically put there, so if you're looking at a font in a different language, that doesn't really show you accents and extended Latin characters and things. Uh, and it also fails every now and then. So it's not, it's detecting something and not showing you what it thinks is there. Uh, but mainly I think the, the issue here is that this is just reading static information from the binary and showing it to you. It's a good start, but it's not what you need to work with a collection or a library. And in my opinion, I think working with a collection is something users are used to doing with like their audio, their music collection. And if you look at an audio player, most of the screen real estate there is devoted to showing you metadata and giving you ways to search it and sort it and, and manipulate the collection through that metadata. That's a rhythm box. This is you know, music, which just shows you there's more than one way to look at the same collection. And then there's uh, auxiliary tools like EasyTag, which allows you to you know, correct that metadata. That's kind of taboo in fonts historically because I think the commercial proprietary font business is concerned about people falsifying information and changing the license and things like that. But in a lot of cases, there's just metadata that you could have in there that would help you when you're searching and sorting, but we don't have tools for doing that on the desktop. Uh, so yeah, to sum up, the metadata for fonts can be hard to get to, um, and it's also sort of split up in different locations, like at a practical level, there's several pieces in the desktop environment that, that read it, but they're disjoint from each other. Uh, there's a little bit in the software center, like I mentioned, you might even have a screenshot, which is metadata. That's handled by AppStream, which is the specification that a lot of um, software center style applications use these days. GTK Font Manager, as I mentioned, is just showing a few things from the binary. Uh, then there's Font Config, which knows some stuff about each font, not everything. Uh, Pango also, if it's in a GTK stack, is recording some metadata, and then there's also some metadata in the font package. You may have screenshots and other information there, too. Um, so yeah, those are different places, and they're not unified. So that means that some of that metadata is duplicated in different places, and some of it is just missing altogether. One thing it's missing, though, is a desktop-wide or per-user cache of the metadata. And I think it's possible that there's interest in, in making that happen, which I'll talk more about in a bit. But um, yeah, because there's so many pieces that need access to metadata about the font, it makes sense to not duplicate it. So just for the, for the context, when I say metadata, here's a dump out of a table that I made trying to track what different uh, applications from that previous slide store. There's everything from the copyright and the trademark notices in the font to what language is designed for, you know, the weight class, panos, vendor ID, there's URLs for you know, the designer and the foundry. Is it a color font? If it is a color font, how many layers is it? 
Uh, is it for vertical layout? That sort of thing. The last one down there, pretty important, user uh, tags. If you want to see the table of this stuff, I put it on a snippet on GitLab. It is a markdown rendered into HTML, which means it's kind of ugly, but uh, it's a start. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the actual metadata options we have today. AppStream, which is that, that pre-installation material you might see. Uh, fortunately, fonts are a top-level object in the AppStream spec. You have software packages, and there's a few other things like codecs that have sort of a special category. But the, the font spec just defines a handful of, uh, of fields for us, including provides, which is where you tell it what font face is included. And you can have more than one of those, so you can indicate that the package contains multiple styles and variations. And the other good news is that the AppStream team has been open to expanding this. I opened an issue on this and suggested a few more sort of simple additions. The designer name and uh, foundry name were pretty obvious because those are things that are very high level. You could obviously go all the way down into those 50 metadata elements, but that's probably not worth it. I added uh, the URL type for the specimen there because there's a lot of websites that are specimens for fonts, and that, that might be something you'd look at before you install it. Um, and the reserve font name one there is sort of a, another tangent. Um, AppStream uses SPDX, Software Packet, Package Data Exchange format to specify licenses. Uh, that can make it tricky because there aren't a whole lot of font licenses currently supported. And you look at the wide range of weird fonts and weird licenses out there. Um, so I've, I've tried to move that forward a little bit too. And in particular, I want to add support for showing that an OFL licensed font has a reserved font name because that, that can be important if you're needing to modify it or something. But moving on. Uh, other good news on this metadata front is that Matthias Klassen, who's a GTK maintainer these days, has been reworking the font selection dialog. And that should be rolling out in September with the 3.24 release. This is a screenshot of one of his earlier attempts. He's in particular been focused, been focused on showing variable fonts support and on showing open type features. This is a newer screenshot where you can see that you can manipulate things. And the examples that he's showing there of the letter case, and actually in the next screenshot you can see some of the stylistic alternates, that's kind of important because that allows you to see what the open type feature actually does. And it turns out that can be tricky knowing what sample string to show. I mean, it's pretty obvious for slash to zero what you want to show, but for these stylistic alternates and for some of these contextual chaining things, you could either look into the font and try and parse the whole G sub table, but that's a lot of work and a lot of time. Or you could maybe just try and find a good word, but then you have to have a dictionary of words. Uh, so we've, we've decided it may, it may be necessary to extend the spec and include a little sample string in the open type table. That's possible. That's already available to you in the character variant feature, but not everywhere. But uh, there's more happening as well. More potentially good news from the GNOME community. And I, I should apologize that I don't really know the KDE side of the story very well. But uh, I did bring up at Quadec a few weeks ago this can we do better with that downloaded zip file question. And the answer is probably, but exactly what form that's going to take is a few releases away maybe. There's interest in handling that better. In particular, you can install things like documentation within the user's home directory in .local slash share slash doc. Uh, so it, it's possible. It's just not obvious necessarily how to automatically do that for any browser that the user might choose. Um, also, yeah, there was some interest in maybe having a, a database of the font metadata at the, at the desktop level. I mentioned when I was talking there that this is the kind of thing that Tracker normally does in the GNOME system. It handles all your photo metadata and all your music metadata. That might not be the way forward because uh, Tracker is really for user-level applications. And this is stuff that needs to be accessible to Pango and these lower level uh, libraries as well. But there's interest in, in moving forward on that, which is really good news. Uh, the next major dimension here is uh, what we actually do about those resources in the downloaded zip file, which also exists in a lot of ways, or sorry, in a lot of cases, 
in distribution packages too. And when I say resources, we're talking about anything other than the font binary that comes packaged with it from upstream. For example, manuals, sometimes there's user documentation that's like a guidebook. It can include specimens, which are showing the font in use. It can include maybe a PNG screenshot, maybe several. There might be a little miniature website that's a resource, and at least having a link to it is, is something. And there can be sort of example code, in particular for, for web content. Uh, wow, that's really acting odd, isn't it? Keith, Keith, why didn't you say something? Uh, it looks really nice on, on this screen, I'll tell you that. Um, so there's a wide variety of, of, of pieces of uh, ancillary auxiliary material here is, is what I'm getting at. And um, in a lot of cases, distro packages will include some of this. Uh, for Debian, the material has to meet the free software guidelines. So if it's a PDF, but we don't have the source that we build the PDF, then it might get taken out by the packager. Um, almost always when the font designer makes the package themselves, you get a ton of stuff. I'm gonna show you some examples of the kind of material that's in one of these. This is from um, an Arabic font called Awami, and it has a lot of detailed information in the manual about how to access certain alternates uh, for stylistic variation. And this is kind of the kind of thing that's important for any linguistic reasons. Uh, sort of the other end of the spectrum, this is a font called Bungie which is uh, one of the very few open source color fonts. It has multiple layers, uh, and there's about an eight page uh, micro website about how to combine those. And this is wh why we call it documentation. If you were to just dive right in without reading that, you would not figure out how to combine all of those and get all the styles that you want. So that can be important stuff, and uh, not just for aesthetic reasons. Uh, this is from E.B. Garamond, which it has a manual that's probably 20 pages long, I think. And there's detail in here about not just what the ligatures and things are, but in some cases why they exist, which is sort of interesting background information. Um, and, and, you know, understanding the intent can be helpful to you. You would need to know, well, if you do know that this font is designed to look like a Renaissance typeface, that's worth knowing. Uh, when I say specimen, that was listed separately from documentation. That generally means something like this. This is from Gentium, which is a really famous, uh, large uh, open source family. And these are usually designed as pamphlets or booklets. They look like marketing material because in the commercial world, they are marketing material. But even for open fonts, you'll typically get it as a PDF as opposed to some other document format. It might be really simple and just show you the characters in, in the big block. But more often, it showcases the font in use in paragraphs and in whole mock documents and things. And that's really the value of it, is it allows you to see uh, context for entire sentences and words. Uh, a lot of times these days, this will be done on the web as well. This is from uh, Yersa. And you know we can at least link to those even if we don't have a copy locally. And this is not purely an aesthetic thing. Specimens can make or break your ability to tell if the font is functioning correctly. Uh, this is Bengali. And if you can see, there are characters that are attached above and below. There are some things that combine together. But if you were to look at GTK Font Manager in that grid, you can't tell if any of those functions actually work. Uh, so seeing the specimen lets you see that it works correctly in text as you need to set text. Anyway, uh, whatever you think of any particular document type, all of those resources currently, if they end up anywhere, get dumped into the user share doc. And I guarantee you no one looks at them again. Uh, we could do better. It's my only point there. You could capture their existence and treat that as metadata to show the user in different places. Uh, we could maybe even tie them into system services. And here's where we enter the third dimension, which is to say that it doesn't have to be just a static reference. Um, what I'm really thinking of here is that if the file resource is something readable by the help system, we could place it in user share help. will automatically get picked up by the help browser, like Yelp. Um, I know that's a huge change. Um, but I will say like that change alone, putting a help document in a different place, makes it accessible to the user in the desktop help system. 
And that's huge. Type foundries complain about this. Mac OS users complain about this because no other operating system does this. It's a source of frustration. The trick is whether you have something readable or not. And we're really getting into the package changes now. It's a real issue. Um, Yelp is capable of reading a few formats like man and info natively. HTML is fortunately one of those. But in all likelihood, um, for Debian font packagers, there could be some work involved. Um, and of course, it's not entirely clear sometimes what constitutes help and what constitutes just general information. Do you need the Renaissance references? Is that help or is that just documentation for your own edification? Uh, it's, it's nebulous. Um, here's another example from the same E.B. Garamond. Uh, this one is a little bit more like help, in my opinion. Um, so he mentions here, for instance, J was not a separate letter at the time. And so one of these character variant features replaces all J's with an I. OK, that actually might be helpful to know. Um, so it's not just telling you what the feature does, but why. And I think that's right on the border between something that's documentation and something that's helpful when you're trying to choose the font. Um, sort of the other side of this, another example from the, the Arabic font is that, OK, one of these is Arabic style, one of them is Urdu style. You need to know that. If you're a native speaker of the language, you might recognize it automatically. Otherwise, this helps the user. Um, but yeah, that, that notion of taking documentation out of user share doc and putting it into user share help or wherever else probably means work because it means pulling some information out of PDFs, maybe. Um, the upstream maintainer may not want to do this. They may not have looked at the font in 10 years. Uh, and changing install paths means, you know, monkeying with your package. And it's always possible there is someone who knows that you have something in user share doc and will get upset to find it gone. Um, and the other thing I, I have to acknowledge here is that changing this to tie into system help is a big chicken and egg issue because users are accustomed to not having any help. Are they going to discover it? I don't know. At worst, it's a no-op. If they don't know that it's in user share doc, they won't know that it's in user share help. But at least in this chicken and egg issue, someone knows where the eggs are. Uh, and that's, that's, that's Yelp or whatever the KDE equivalent is. Uh, so there's a few other things, just moving on, still on the package behavior front, where I think we could improve. Uh, consistency is not perfect when you look at your font library as a whole. And I mean, it's fine down to a point, but this is just a random selection of font package names. So the first one there, cross core, is a set of like unrelated style uh, fonts that just sort of come from the same uh, development project. Deja Vu Core is one font. George Williams is a designer's name. Gucher is a language. Fonts Awesome is a web resource that's not a font at all. Uh, Indic, actually, Gucher and Indic are both meta packages, but there's issues with that too. Sil Ezra, the SIL is a font foundry. Ezra is the name of the typeface. GS Fonts is totally different. Unifont doesn't even have the same prefix as everything else. So yeah, we could probably do better there. Um, same is true with the install paths. Uh, in a lot of ways, people install to user share fonts and then the file type. But it doesn't always work that way. Here again, uh, Noto at the top is a mega family from Google. Leto or Lanto, and this is where we need someone who speaks Polish, is one particular small family by the same person. And then you have Lohit, which has split Bengali and Assamese into two directories there, even though it's the same writing system. Beng Extra is not a meta package like Gujar was. That's a set of unrelated fonts that just happen to support Bengali. Samyak ends up in two different places. And then Droid Fallback doesn't even end up under the same directory as everything else. And then the last one down there, Sortsmill, that is the, uh, let's see, what is that? Gaudi book letter, maybe? But uh, the issue is that it has a sort of uh, dump everything in the same place approach, including some OTFs, some TTFs, and some SFDs, which are font forged source files. They all end up in user share fonts. Uh, yeah, sure. There's nothing insightful about me saying, let's fix some bugs in packaging. Um, we all want packages to be excellent. I agree. Uh, I'm only mentioning it here because this having better consistency across the font library can help with that big font dichotomy about the software and, and content issue. Because 
well, um, Debian has a, a large influence here. And uh, these are rough numbers, Google fonts, about 848 families, open font library, almost anyone can upload things there. So it's got more, but Debian is third on the list. And it's a little hard to count some distributions. Um, so consistency is a good example for other people, um, but also the name and, of the package and the fallback path are, uh, are in the path are, are fallback mechanisms. So ideally, the font manager will exist and give you the UI you need to find stuff. Failing that, the software center helps you find stuff. Failing that, you can drop down at the command line and figure out where something might be if you have it. And there's also maybe some technical reasons to think about um, being ultra, ultra consistent on this sort of thing. Like the GTK font explorer example I mentioned earlier, if you want to provide a link to a PDF specimen or documentation in that, then you have to find your way backwards from the font explorer to where that directory is in user share or whatever. That's not obvious. The, the faces that are available that high up in the stack might be virtual faces like serif. And that means going through font config. So if there's a little more consistency, it's a little easier to maybe find your way down to the right place. Personally, I would like to see Debian font packagers adapt the two-tier scheme where you include the foundry name. Uh, and I know that's controversial. Um, it's sort of weird to some people, but some packagers do it already. Uh, I've got a couple reasons for that. The first is that you can always have name collisions because people aren't necessarily creative about choosing their font names, and most people don't really search to see what names are taken. Also, it sort of mirrors the, the metadata structure of audio tracks, which is artist album track. And in this case, there's not really a good way to put the, the artist in there because fonts have multiple designers. It also just communicates that relationship to the user, which is helpful in certain situations. And reality is that you want to coexist with these fonts. People are downloading from the web, and when people download from the web, they put them in folders and organize them in this fashion. You might dump all your fonts into separate folders the first few times, but eventually you realize that more than a screen worth and it's too complex, so you start sorting them yourself. Um, and yeah, that would involve adopting this method, adopting this model would involve packagers changing some things, and I want to be careful about just telling people that they should go do this. I understand it could be a sensitive issue, so I would love to get some feedback on it. Uh, the final, I think it's the final sensitive issue I would bring up is that when we talk about metadata, we don't always have everything we need in the font. And it'd be nice to say, well, we'll just add it. All right, but if the upstream author doesn't want to make a help file for you, and if they don't want to add fields to the name table that include the designer name and URLs and things like that, what do you do? Um, well, making your own HTML help file is one thing. Patching the font binary, really different. Uh, you might just be adding to the font with, with metadata, but for an OFL font with a reserved font name, that triggers you having to rename the font. And also, it can just irritate people. Um, so yeah, it could be controversial to actually do that if you're the packager. I would say that's one of the main challenges. Um, it could be hard to get the information you need from upstream at all, like why exactly does this feature exist? Upstream may not even have version control that you can get them to agree to use, in which case you're going to be maintaining that patch against the font perpetually. Uh, and then, yeah, you just by doing this, you could ups upset the upstream author. You could upset downstream users. You could upset strangers, I guess. Um, and then it's just going to be a compatibility issue, perhaps, for people who get your patched version of the font with excellent metadata. And then they talk to their friends who don't have that metadata, metadata and they get confused. Uh, but I, I think it's still worth considering because all of these little changes to packages, including some extra metadata fields, including some PDFs, making some help files, that is what incrementally moves you towards the white screened fantasy land examples early on. And that is it. That's all I have to say on this subject. Uh, as I said, this is me saying, hey, font packagers, you should do stuff. So I would really like to hear back from other people who are maintaining font packages as to what parts of this sound crazy and what parts of it sound slightly less crazy. Um, so if you don't have a question right now, there's lots of ways to contact me. Any method you choose is fine by me. But we've got about five minutes if anyone has comments or questions right now. 
They're welcome. Thanks. Uh-oh. All right. Yeah. I do know that you maintain some font packages. So. I do maintain a font package. Um, I think your idea of putting the font packages in, in well-defined directories is a great idea. Um, we can just put that in Debian policy. That's really easy to do. Um, I don't think there'd be any controversy there. The nice thing about policy is that it's, it's a place where people look to see what they should do. Uh, yeah. Policy is never a place that says what you must do. Mm -hmm. um, and having guidance for packagers is always helpful. Packagers are always looking for what should I be doing here, not what I must do. Um, could we put the metadata, this extra metadata, just in the same directory as the fonts? There is a well-defined location for each face now, for each family. Yeah. Uh, could we just put the, could we construct a file format to put the metadata alongside the fonts in the same directory? Because we, given that they're, given that we have the font path information, we could construct the file name for the metadata and go right. find it pretty easily. Right. Would that work? Uh, in theory, yes, absolutely. Um, the, the trick there is, uh, and this, this has come up before, uh, the GTK folks asked the same question. Yeah. Um, for the general use case, if you're the font publisher, having to maintain those two fonts is not ideal. But if you're the font publisher, put it in the font file, right? So for us who are downstream, um, there's not already an obvious metadata sidecar format. We could probably find one that's compatible somewhere. And that would be interesting to do. Um, but let's see, what else was I going to say about that? Yeah, I, I think it, at this point, that's that's probably the the big hurdle is that we have to determine what format to save that in. So somebody with font expertise might want to actually come up and specify a format, um, and then build a library that would allow you to get at that. Right, and and yeah. So, so somebody with experience in the field of typography right. with a degree in that area. That kind of person. Useful, yeah. 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 Well, I, I, and you know, the, the thing is that you, you want to do that in conjunction with whatever's happening with trying to track it in a local, local database. So, so is, is font config a place, to, is, is font config a database that should contain that additional metadata information? Um, so my impression from a brief conversation with font config folks is that's a little too much. It's a little, it's a little bit outside of font config's original uh, intent. And so maybe that's not, maybe that's overkill for having font config do it. But I think like there was interest in having somewhere in the dot config where no keeps track that, of other stuff. Do you, do you anticipate that metadata being used for font matching or font location, or is it just really for uh, user, dis, user, some user interface discovery mechanism? Well, there's a lot of potential uses for it. Um, the, other, the other big one, other than just the user facing stuff, is what do you do when you need to replace a missing font in a document? Exactly. Uh, and so some of that metadata could be used, if not to automatically choose a replacement font to guide you towards a good replacement font. Um, and then there's potential uses that are in other fields like linguistics and translations. I, I don't, I'm not a translator, but I know that translators have a lot of tools at their disposal and good language support and knowing stylistic things can be important to them. So I would say those are orthogonal use cases. And it's not all just showing the user stuff to, to, to play around with. So there may be some synergy with font config, but it might be not be the same thing. But you might have a yeah. tool that would run over the font config database and discover and and construct or discover this additional metadata. Then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Parts of the, the metadata you mentioned, like supported character sets, supported languages, this, this would be something that I think would be very interesting to have in font config, because this is important if I select a font. Right, and, and in case I wasn't clear, the, the, uh, the GitLab table that I mentioned includes what font config currently does track. And it does include some of that stuff. I don't remember that if it's a language thing or not. The language, determining language support can be tricky um, because people don't always agree on what support means. Yeah, so so in, this, in this sense, I, I would strongly support to, to add, even if it's an ad hoc decision, to, uh, a specific definition for a sidecar for phones, where we can save the metadata. Of course, we can, if there is support from other libraries ever, we can always change the sidecar definitions, whatever. 
But it sounds good. I was just given the flag that we all need to rush outside for the group photo, so I guess we're out of time. Um, but thank you for your comments, and we can keep talking during the group photo, maybe even. Nope, we're going. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much.